Hi everybody, uh, welcome to another webinar. This is JC Vijay, I'm an North South National Team member and the coordinator for the webinars. Glad to see you all here today. So uh, thank you for joining and uh, thank you, Hemant, CH, and Priyanka uh, being with us today. And then uh, before I introduce the panel to the special that since it's a brain bee webinar, let me start with a small quiz. quiz. Because if I know the names, you are bound to know as well. Anyway, let me post this to you. Where do we store the information about what we ate for breakfast today, which we may forget by that dinner time? And what was your favorite food item during your relatives' marriage very years ago? Just think about it. We can talk about it later. We have with us the current president of North South uh, Foundation, Dr. Talon Narajan Thank you, Dr. Vijay. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. First, we have Priyanka Sentil. Priyanka is a senior in high school in Reno, Nevada. She has participated in the Brain Bee since the eighth grade, and in 2019 was the third place winner in the National Brain Bee. She's passionate about neuroscience and has taken college courses already in both neuroscience and psychology. She works as a research intern in two neuroscience research labs at the University of Nevada, Reno. In one lab, she's studying the role of inhibitory parvalbumin neurons in neuroplasticity. In her other lab, she is studying synaptic transmission in the mouse brain using the calyx of HELD as a model synapse. After school, she enjoys working with children with various special needs conditions from autism to attention deficit to Down syndrome at her local respite care center. Welcome, Priyanka. Sahaj Bindra is a student at UC Berkeley intending to study molecular biology. He received third place in the 2018 National Brain Bee. Outside of the Brain Bee, Sahaj studied under Dr. Charles Pigeon, co-author of Vision Facts, Questions About the Human Eye, and works at SIO Virtual to provide advanced science courses for middle school students taught by experienced high school and college competitors. And our third panelist is Hemant Ashirvadam. He's a student at Harvard University he attended the Research Science Institute at MIT and was awarded in the top 10 presentations. He's a state AP scholar, has placed second at the US National Brain Bee and the North-South Foundation National Brain Bee, and is a two-time ISEF finalist. He has led and instructed school teams for Model UN, Science Bowl, Debate, and STEM Society, and in the free time that's left, Hemant enjoys watching Star Trek, rereading Harry Potter for the hundredth time, and beating his friends in Monopoly, Werewolf, or really any other non-physical game. We were to have one more panelist, Dr. Manjila, who is on our Brain B core team. He is a neurosurgeon working at the Hartford Healthcare Medical Group in Connecticut. He trained in neurosurgery at India's prestigious Christian Medical College in Bellur and did a repeat residency here at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio. He enjoys cranial as well as spinal neurosurgery and is the co-author of a spine surgery textbook called Lumbar Interbody Fusions. He has published over 100 peer-reviewed PubMed indexed papers with 1,600 plus citations. He's also a reviewer for several neurosurgery journals and serves on the Content Development Committee of North-South Foundation. He's also a member of the North American Skull Base Society, the CNS and AANS Cerebrovascular Section, and the National Academy of Medical Sciences. And even though he cannot join us, I do believe that Dr. Gowdy has a little bit of information from him to share with the group. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Vijay. Dr. Manjulo, um couldn't make it today because uh, he was um, on an emergency travel, but he took the time to record a six minute video of an excerpt of a set of slides that I selected from his longer presentation. 
So I'm going to share the screen and his video. By the way, he recorded the video on his way to the airport <laughs> before getting. So uh, he's really wanted to be here, but he couldn't be. But he's willing to share this and um, take any questions and respond to the participants later. Everybody, welcome to North South Foundation Brain Bee webinar. Uh, I'm sure you're all excited, and uh, this is a great opportunity for us. Let me first congratulate uh, the organizers who have put all this together. And uh, uh, it is uh, a great privilege for me to talk to uh, the young neuroscientists in the making. Uh, go to the first slide. Uh, this is a picture of my mom, whom I lost when I was 12 with a brain bleed. She had an aneurysm rupture, uh, which means a ballooning of the blood vessel in the base of the brain uh, that took her life away. At that point of time, I did not know what's the difference between neurology and neurosurgery, but I knew for a fact that I'm going to do something in this area uh, that is going to you know, fix the problem. So what's the difference between neurology and neurosurgery? Neurologists diagnose the diseases without operation and treat them without operation. As a neurosurgeon, we get into the OR, you know, um, to fix the problems either with surgery or without surgery. When I say with surgery, uh, cutting open the skin and get into the skull or the spine to treat the problems in the spinal cord and the, and the brain, whereas uh, there are options of operating without cutting using gamma knife, cyber knife, etc. All right, next slide. Um, the unique features of neurosurgery is that it's a very uh, tissue-friendly specialty. It's the only specialty uh, which uh, treats uh, disease conditions on multiple tissues, whether the skull, spine as in bone, blood vessels inside the blood vessel, outside the blood vessel, uh, tumors, pediatric cases, uh, trauma cases, uh, degenerative cases, you know, all, all kinds of pathologies. And we have got the most complex clinical exam so that we can localize exactly where in the brain or spine, anywhere in the neural axis, uh, the problems are. And also we have got a lot of uh, novel diagnostic technologies as well as, uh, uh, and it is a noble profession with a good social stature and remuneration. So it is very, uh, very cool at the same time, noble profession uh, to uh, join neurosciences. There are many subspecialties in neurosurgery. Uh, which are, like I said, there's neurotrauma, neuro-oncology, tumors, right? uh, neurovascular, uh, skull-based surgery, functional neurosurgery, which means treating epilepsy as well as the tremors and dystonias by using deep brain stimulation leads and uh, uh, um, ultrasound and so many other facilities. So everything is evolving rapidly, um, and uh, we do peripheral nerves. Uh, there is even pediatric and psychiatric neurosurgery, restorative neurosurgery, etc. Next slide. So these are the pictures of some spine surgery. We expose the spine, we instrument them, we fix them. Uh, and there's a lot of research going on in restoration of spinal cord damages. Next slide, pediatric neurosurgery. As you can see, all the congenital deformities in the brain and the spinal cord, we fix them. Next slide, uh, the peripheral nerves. Uh, look at the peripheral nerves, the ulnar nerve, the radial nerve, the cubital nerve, uh, the, the median nerve for causing the carpal tunnel syndrome. The, the, there's so many nerves in the upper extremities. Uh, that get entrapped, and uh, we can release the entrapment or the compression, and the patient will better. Same applies to the lower extremity as well. Uh, next slide. We have got this neural navigation and stereotaxy uh, shown in the picture, where we can see that uh, we can plan the surgery beforehand, and uh, we know exactly where in uh, the dimensional space the pathology is, how minimally invasively we can get in there. Next slide. This is a skull base endoscopy, uh, which is one of my passions. Uh, I go from uh, the, through the nose to get to the, uh, the base of the skull and treat the problems there are, particularly the tumors. Next slide. Next, this is a transcranial. So you go through a small incision here, get into the brain, and then fix problems within the brain, ventricles especially. Next slide. So you can see that uh, uh, the frame that is attached to the person's skull in this slide, where you, uh, you uh, pass a lead. This can be used for taking small biopsies. Uh, for diagnosis, and also uh, we can do that for uh, deep brain stimulation for uh, tremors, Parkinsonism. Next slide. Uh, there is a lot of uh, innovations that are going on in neurosurgery, in restorative neurosurgery, as well as fetal neurosurgery, where the baby or the fetus can be operated while in the womb. Uh, next slide. Uh, Fun apart, neurosurgery is a, a lot of uh, effort and requires a lot of specialized training. Next slide. 
Uh, it will be in the pressure monitoring. You know, we need to know what the pressure is in the brain, especially when there's trauma or brain swelling. The pressure in the brain increases, and uh, uh, we have got a lot of modern technological advances to measure the intracranial pressures. Next slide. Uh, Intraoperative neuromonitoring. There are specialists who come into the operating room while I'm operating, where they put leads into the uh, scalp as well as the different parts of the body. So you know if I'm approaching the vital structures of the brain or the spine cord, so that I don't injure them while when I remove the abnormal parts of the uh, of the of the brain. Very 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 cool. Next one, we look at the anatomy here. The arteries, the nerves, and the, uh, the veins. Uh, it's very uh, uh, important that you have a good understanding of the neuroanatomy before going in there, right? Next slide is a Glasgow Trauma Score. Somebody is like unconscious. Level of unconsciousness can be uh, evaluated by a, a grading system called a Glasgow Trauma Score. It's been prevalent for many years. Of course, it's with its own lacunae, but uh, it's, a, uh, it's universally employed, and there's a common language that the neurologists are interested in stock uh, to, uh, to make this. Next slide. Uh, so we have got a lot of problems which are not settled yet in neurosciences, and we need you. You are the young blossoms uh, who are going to uh, flower and make all these uh, uh, these uh, dreams into fruition. Next slide. We have got an emerging branch of robotics in neurosurgery, particularly the spine, more evolving in the cranial space now. Next slide. This is uh, the prevalent uh, uh, spine robotics. Next slide. Uh, if you have got that, you know. Uh, extra. Okay, I, I think I should stop here because uh, he uh, lo I, we lost the last bit of the um, audio there. Basically, uh, he wanted to end uh, by saying, um, you know, there is a lot of opportunities and uh, we need all the young minds to really start thinking about, uh, you know, taking part in the uh, brain V events and uh, learn more about neuroscience to its uh, solving all the complex problems. So with that, I'll stop here and uh, you can take over uh, the panel. Thank you. Before we start, I would like uh, each one of you to talk for a couple minutes about that. Hi everyone, um, my name is Priyanka and uh, like Dr. Nandraja introduced me, um, I'm a high school senior and um, I'm I started um, participating in brain week competitions in the eighth grade, and I've gone interested in neuroscience ever since. So I've been able to, um, I've, I've been competing ever um, since then, and I've also had the opportunity to take um, neuroscience courses and psychology courses at my local university. So that's been really helpful in helping me um, delve deeper into neuroscience and also um, participate in research with um, professors at my university. So I'm really grateful for having the opportunity to participate in BrainBee such so early on because I've been um, able to explore that field more and I, that's definitely something I want to pursue in college. And um, related to that, I've also been able to pursue some extracurricular activities around that. So um, at my local respite care center, I've been able to interact with children with very special needs conditions and that's been very meaningful because um, I've been able to kind of connect what I've read um, in the brain practice book and other neuroscience textbooks to um, conditions and symptoms that I'm seeing in, in the children in real life. So that's been very interesting. And um, I was also a part of um, a company called Awesome and we created at home therapy kits for children with special needs. So that was a very nice experience um, that I had over the summer. Yeah. Um, so are we talking a bit about our experience with neuroscience and involved? Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, I kind of first got into neuroscience when I was, um, and um, Dr. Natarajan mentioned this. Um, I worked with um, a professor, Dr. Pigeon, in writing uh, these books on sensory physiology. And um, a lot of people who I worked with, uh, they did the Brain Bee. Uh, so I tried it out. Um, and when I competed in the Brain Bee, I competed for two years. Uh, in ninth grade as well as 10th grade. Um, the, the first year I participated, I wasn't really, um, I didn't really know much. I just kind of went into the competition and got every question wrong. Um, and then I learned that I needed to study. So I studied a bit. And then in 10th grade, I got to compete at the National Brain Bee, um, where I placed third place um, uh, right after him month. Um, and 
uh, yeah, that's basically my background with uh, neuroscience. I'm also interested in uh, human behavior in general. I, I enjoy reading books, watching videos. Um, but yeah, um, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, did you say my name? Yeah, did you? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, just presume so. So, um, yeah, I'm Hemant again. Um, I, uh, in terms of getting interested in the brain, that, that kind of started um, a long time ago, like when I was in elementary school around like fourth or fifth grade. Um, it came from two angles. Well, one was like, you know, standard, you know, brain um, neuroscience thing, more along the route of um, neurological, like, problems that can emerge because you know my dad is a doctor so he would tell me and my siblings about like kind of you know oh these are the diseases you see these are all the problems that come up and it was really that part which made me interested more in the brain than about any other specialty in medicine because um when it comes to the brain it is both a uniquely capable organ like there are just things that the brain can do that nothing else in the world can do not nothing we make nothing um that um exists in the body and then there's also problems that are just so mysterious um, in the brain because of its complexity, because of all those those um, those things that make it great also can make it so difficult to understand, which made it particularly interesting, even when I didn't really understand much about biology at the time. Uh, the other side of it was um, something I'm sure a lot of you all are familiar with now, like with the whole like AI artificial intelligence stuff, especially nowadays with like, you know, the neural networks and everything. Um, I was like, for a long time, I've always like liked technology, like, you know, like messing around with that sort of stuff. Um, and like AI, you know, early versions of like speech recognition and voice assistance, stuff like that. It always was like super interesting to me how those kinds of things worked. And that kind of provoked me to get more interested in how those kind of things works in our brain, where it's still right now is the reign supreme in all those fields. So it was kind of the intersection of both that interest of, of disease a diseasedness and um, artificializing, making artificial versions of the brain that, that motivated my interest. Thank you very much, uh, The first question I have is, uh, how can a sixth grade students get involved in such awesome projects? And uh, when should they start getting involved in projects with academia or industry? Who wants to take it up? Um, I can take that, um, at least, I mean, I think both of Sahaj and Priyanka have probably done more um, active research in the academic field, so you can explain that part, but um, in terms of like sixth grade, um, I, for at least personally, for the lo for a long time, I just did projects like at home style projects. I didn't get involved in like act active research labs until like 10th or 11th grade at the earliest. Um, and really, I didn't get too involved in that. Um, and I think that kind of helped me really like learn the whole experimental method very solidly because i had to like you know develop it from scratch and think of my own ideas even if they weren't like the most brilliant projects or whatever um so like for example in sixth grade i just did something about like um i did like a cognitive like a psychological experiment involving like some magnets stuff like that um different things to see how they would affect some like participants like performance on cognitive tests and then like the next year I did it like on a worm, just like putting in some like very cheap electrodes and measuring the electrical activity in a worm's action potential and its, and its long nerve through like those through its center. So like those kind of projects, really simple things to make them, but they really forced me to like understand the basics really well. So I think for a sixth grader, um, it's best to just like try to think of your own, like if you're interested in neuroscience or whatever you are interested in science related, just try to think of your own um, little like fun projects, even if they're not like, you know, involving like curing cancer or whatever, just work on those and really try to create a really strong experiment that really gets something new out of it that um, that's really solid. And then the, hopefully from there, you'll be able to advance into academic style research later on. Yeah. Um, do you hear something? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Okay, maybe it's just me, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, what Hemant was mentioning with like electrodes and worms, that sounds insane. Like I can't even do that right now, but uh, that sounds pretty cool. Um, I remember when I was in sixth grade, I would just, um, I honestly had no idea really what neuroscience was, or um, I, I would just read stuff maybe on Wikipedia. Uh, that's as deep as I would go. 
uh, into the sciences. Um, and actually recently, um, so I actually work with a lot of middle school students, sixth graders, seventh graders, and um, I help manage these STEM courses through something called Sio Virtual. And part of my job is to consult a lot of education experts, um, whether it's middle school teachers, people who do research in education. Um, and recently I was actually talking, do you guys hear something? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, I guess it's background music. Um, yeah, but basically I was talking to an education expert uh, in engineering specifically as a PhD, Dr. Singh. Um, and I told him, hey, we have these courses. And what we're trying to do is we have these sixth graders, seventh graders, just a couple of thousands of registrants. And we want to make sure that each student, they get a head start, you know, whether it's becoming a better scientist later on, doing well in coursework. Uh, and we basically just wanted to provide quality STEM education. So I asked him, what can a sixth grader do or a seventh grader do at this moment to become a better scientist in the future? And I was expecting him things to say like, uh, to say things like, you know, start doing math problems, getting those skill sets, start doing data analysis, start like doing all these like skills. And I was trying to like get that answer from him. Uh, but what he said was, and I found this very interesting, that current education research in engineering at least is more geared towards just making people interested in the subject. So I think that might touch a bit on Himant was saying when you know he's interested, how how do these neurological disorders happen? He tried out things. Um, I think what, what he told us was that it's important to not try to force people to develop these skills and do practice problems all the time. What's important is to get, and what, what's going to help you more in the long term is finding something that you're interested in, something that excites you. And that's going to help you more in the long term. So, um, and he also said working in groups, collaborating, uh, doing projects together. So the biggest advice I'd give to a sixth grader is just discover things. Um, and it's a bit hard to do virtually. Um, so I think finding um, whatever opportunities, working with people uh, in a virtual capacity. Um, and I actually think, uh, and that's actually what we're implementing right now at SIO Virtual. I'm gonna plug that. Um, and it, and what that basically what that organization is is working with other students, connecting virtually, um, and just finding something you're interested in. So that's the biggest advice I would give, uh, and not stressing. Uh, that's another big thing the person told me. Yeah, just kind of picking back, picking off of what um, Sahaj and Himan said. I think that those are all great advice. I would say just um, spend the, the time in sixth grade and just exploring different subjects. And um, it doesn't have to be neuroscience. Don't try to like force yourself to go um, into one path. I never thought I never thought about going into neuroscience or like studying neuroscience before. It just um, kind of all, all kind of fell in place when I started. Um, reading the brain facts book and exploring that field so i would say just ex um, in sixth grade you don't have to commit to anything at that point so just take the time to um, look at different fields whether it be science engineering uh, find out what you're interested in you can take online courses there's a bunch of um, courses online so whether it be just simple courses like coursera or you can go through um, mit um, through schools like that and, and take online courses, um, figure out what you like to learn about, and then um, take that to the next level if, you, if, you, if you're if you ready and you're interested in that. So um, you can work with your teacher if you want to do um, a research project like Himoth was explaining, or you can team up with a group of friends or um, interested in the same subject and just create a, like a summer project or um, something that you want to investigate. And it doesn't have to be just something that you do yourself, but you can definitely get guidance from teachers and, and other peers. And then I also do want to say that it's never too early to reach out. Um, I, it's it might be harder to get research opportunities when you're younger, but um, once you like hit ninth grade, definitely reach out to professors if you want to do research in that field. You can reach out to professors in your local university and even um, ask for remote opportunities. So it doesn't have to be just um, in near your area. And um, while you may not hear back from a lot of people or might. Um, get a no from a few people. Don't let that discourage you. Just keep reaching out, and um, I'm sure that you'll find a, a professor who'd be um, who'd want to work with you. So um, de definitely just figure out what you're interested in, and then take initiative to pursue that. Uh, the next question I'm going to answer is uh, probably you covered it now, but. Uh, what are the good ways to prepare for the painting? That's what you are talking about. So, 
your question, what are the good ways to prepare for the brain bee? Yeah. Um, okay, I guess I'll start again. Um, so, I mean, uh, Priyanka brought up the, the main thing in terms of the brain bee, which is the brain facts book, uh, which anyone who's like, you know, actively trying to prepare for uh, the brain bee should, you know, down, it's a, just a free PDF online, just download the brain facts book. Uh, because I mean, for the like regional and state, like, you know, non NSF version of the brain bee, the regional and state is entirely based on that brain facts book. So if you know that one, I mean, it, it's kind of a downside in some ways because the questions get really, really specific the higher up you go in the state competition. Um, but um, you do learn stuff, a lot of stuff in that book because um, you kind of squeeze everything out of it. Same for NSF. Um, it, the, the most, not all of them, but most of the questions are based off of the brain facts book. But beyond that, um, it really depends on your your learning style. Like personally, um, especially once I was going on to the national level brain bees, both for NSF and um, mainly for the actual national one, like those, I really engage um, less with like purely text things and more with like video stuff. So I would just watch a ton of YouTube videos um, on stuff. Like, you know, there's like this channel called Oxygen, which um, has a lot of videos on diagnostics, like for medical school students on diagnostic uh, um, procedures and understanding um, illnesses of neuro neuroscience. So that was fantastic. Um, in particular, I recommend, um, and this one is anyone could do it right now because it's a fantastic channel. It's called Two Minute Neuroscience. It's a YouTube channel. Um, and basically it'll take two minutes, like every video is two minutes, there's like a hundred or some 200 of them, um, two minutes and they explore, explain one concept to like a reasonable depth um, in the brain. And those kind of things really engaged me because I liked, you know, I like watching the stuff. I like seeing the neurons and all the different stuff going on while I'm learning about it. So I would highly recommend something like that. Um, just like, like uh, Sahaj said, going down a Wikipedia rabbit hole, if you like that sort of thing, or really exploring on YouTube. Like, you know, I, I really recommend that two minute neuroscience subject because that's how I learned a lot of these concepts um, at a deeper level. Um, and it, it did also help me a lot in the brain bee, especially the national level ones. Yeah, I see. So what resources did you prefer to use to prefer the national level? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. And it probably I can't really speak too much to the NSF. I heard it's very similar to the national brain bee. Um, so just talking about that, um, what Himan said, I think exactly it. Um, start off with brain facts. And now the question kind of is is I think there are two parts of this question on how prepare on how to prepare. The first one is what resources should you use, and the second one is how do you study those resources. Uh, in terms of the resources, again, start off with brain facts. Um, I remember when I was in ninth grade, when and I, and I said this before, I heard about Brain Bee. I I went to the competition, and I couldn't even pass the first round within the regional round. I didn't know anything, and I did read brain facts. Uh, the problem is I didn't know how to read it necessarily. I didn't have great study strategies. Um, everything I just read, I would forget the next day and I wouldn't review it. So um, basically after I failed the uh, the regional brain bee in ninth grade, um, I was actually great friends with the person who won the regional brain bee. Uh, he was from my school. Uh, and I basically just bugged him with a bunch of questions. I figured out how do you study? He was kind of like a mentor to me. Um, you know, I figured out how to study. Um, I uh, I started using Quizlets. I started having a more organized schedule. Uh, before in, in ninth grade, um, I would just, whatever I felt like doing that day, I would just randomly do it. Like if I wanted to read about neuroethics for the 10th time, because that was the easiest chapter to understand, I would continuously read that one. And there were no questions about neuroethics in the regional brain bee. Um, so yeah, I, I had a lot of gaps in my knowledge. Um, and then Coming into 10th grade, I spent a lot more time reading brain facts from cover to cover, memorizing it. I honestly think brain facts, like memorizing, it's kind of useless. It's just a bunch of trivia. Uh, but going into the national brain bee, um, I think what Himanth was talking about videos, I think, yeah, I think I found them helpful as well, specifically for patient diagnosis, uh, which at least is a big thing in the US national brain bee. Um, I watched a lot of like clinical diagnosis videos. I watched, um, I watched, or I, I also read the DSM parts of it, the relevant parts, uh, which was overkill, which probably actually hurt my score. Um, and I did a lot of neuroanatomy. Uh, and also, if any of you guys are from Central Jersey, or if not, 
you probably should move to central Jersey uh, because if you win the brain bee there, uh, the medical school staff trains you and they give you like a lot of resources for neuroanatomy, uh, neurohistology, as well as MRI. So the, the specific ways to repair, like we could talk about that for hours, what resources are good or what aren't, um, but it's a lot of just Googling stuff, watching videos and reading the materials they have and a lot of practice, I would say. Um, yeah, just to quickly cap that up, um, exactly what Sahedra said, I wanted to stress one more thing was that like, it is just like what Sahedra was saying, it's really, really important that you um, explore these topics more freely, like especially like when you go through this brain facts book, if you don't like, you know, like ask yourself questions about it, Google stuff, watch videos when you're reading through it, you're going to get bored eventually because otherwise it is just memorizing like a 80 page booklet or whatever. It's not going to be that interesting if that's all you're doing. So like um, one great way to do that is like to go through it with like a parent once you've read it once, like have them ask you questions about it. And when you don't know it, then you Google it and you explore stuff further, that sort of thing. Um, because if you don't, if you don't like personally like find something you're interested in, explore it, especially like Ted was talking about like with the um, videos or the diagnostic stuff, the diseases, really click with something, you're going to eventually get bored before you can like memorize it. And what, like what's the point if you're just memorizing it? I'm going to reflect to you guys uh, how you are feeling. When did you really start competing with the Did NSF competitions help you at all? Or are you very interested? There's some noise. I Dr. Can't hear Dr. You. Vijay, your audio is not coming in great. Uh, okay. I'll just rephrase uh, while you go on mute. Um, so I think the question that was asked is, you know, when did you really get into the brain bee competitions and we'll do a round robin but also you know if at all and how right did the north south competitions assist you in that regard we'll start with priyanka and then we'll go to hammond then we'll go to sahaj after that so i've i've competed um for north south foundation from eighth grade like i said but i also did um compete in my regional competition for the u.s brain bee but it, it was canceled due to the pandemic the the finals was canceled so um, I can I can talk to both um, for both of them. So the NSF really did help me. The Brain Facts book is um, used by both, and so definitely starting early um, in eighth grade, I wasn't too invested in reading the Brain Facts book and and really memorizing it. But it was a good introduction. And the Brain Facts book each page is packed with so much information. So I was a little bit overwhelmed in eighth grade and. But don't be definitely um, you're going to have to read the brain facts book several times. The first time might just be to kind of understand what is going to be asked on the test, what um, needs to be covered. And then a second read will be for more closer details and a third read, maybe for you to take notes um, on what you're struggling with. And for me personally, um, the process of reading the brain facts book several times was really helpful since I created um, just very basic uh, studies study sheets for myself so just on a google doc um a table with some of the disorders and their symptoms and their treatments so medications was something that i really struggled with um, since there's so many medications mentioned um throughout the brain facts book and so definitely um you can expect a few questions about medications on the test so you need to know what the medication does what it helps for um like who it should be administered to and when. So all that information is um, is hard to memorize. And so take notes on what you find difficult. And I also use Quizlet. So I just kept adding to my Quizlets over time and my Quizlet ended up being about 800 um, cards. So definitely just take it chapter by chapter, note down what, you, um, what you're interested in and also like how, um, what Hamant and Sehaj said, um, definitely change things up since reading the Brain Facts book over and over again isn't going to be as interesting and you definitely want to be interested in this because that's what's going to help you um sustain since it's a it's a marathon not a sprint um and you definitely want to want to keep wanting to learn more and so um i tried different things like uh, in addition to the Brain Facts book, I cross reference with another neuroscience textbook, and I just found this book online for free. So there's a bunch of them, and you can figure out which one you like. So if you're reading about sleep, um, also 
cross-reference with another textbook because that might provide you with more information and might be more interesting to um, switch it up at times. And also YouTube videos um, were great in helping me prepare for both the NSF and the US. They're, they're pretty similar, but um, the U YouTube videos were very um, useful for um, looking at patient symptoms. So that's uh, often a question asked on the exams. Um, so like what symptoms might be characteristic of different disorders. And while you can definitely read about them, when you see them on U on YouTube or when you see a person actually with the symptoms, it's definitely more memorable. And um, so I would definitely say the NSF uh, aligns pretty well with the US Brain B. Um, I think the US Brain B has a little bit more of an emphasis on a clinical diagnosis, um, like Sahaj mentioned but um, both of them go in line very well. And any extra information that you read for one or the other will just help you. And um, if you find your science interesting in, in general, then uh, both of them, both of the competitions will be a great fit for you. And you, sh you should be well prepared for both if you prepare for one specifically. So <clears throat> I wanna just piggyback on a few things, Priyanka, before we go to Hemant. So, First of all, I'm glad you said the, I'm glad you gave the marathon sprint analogy. We're gonna cover that in a little bit at the end. But my second question, right, is you talked about, for example, making the Quizlet, you talked about um, how to really focus on medications, right? Beyond brain B, right, did that approach help you in any way? For example, right, you're doing work on lung cancer prevention, which we didn't even talk about earlier, right? does it cross over to the rest of your life in any way? Oh, absolutely. Um, so I mentioned that I've um, taken a few neuroscience courses at my, my local university. So just that having that background information and prior knowledge before entering these classes definitely really helped to me. Um, so some of the courses that I was taking, the introductory courses that I was taking were already covered by the brain pack. So what you're learning is definitely material that is, um, is challenging and is hard. So um, the fact that of students are starting to learn this information very early on is great and it's like equivalent to an introductory level neuroscience class at college so just know that when you're um just just be proud of yourself that you're even like taking the time to learn this and um it definitely does apply so um now i've been able to go into some more advanced classes and you you need a really strong foundation and so being able to get that foundation early on and just keep building upon it has been very useful and it's definitely transferred to my research as well it's made um my research more uh it just a little bit easier and has helped me glean more from it because i've been if i'm looking at a neuron or a specific brain area i'm able to not only like memorize what it does but also um apply apply it to how it affects different disorders, um, what can be done to kind of help treat those disorders and just connect neuroscience to like a, a broader level than what I probably would have if I had just gone into research without prior knowledge. And then same with the lung cancer research. Lung cancer is, is totally unrelated to neuroscience, but there's um, we're actually just looking at um, one of the studies on how aromatherapy can help reduce um, pain and improve outcomes with um, with lung cancer surgery, and that also connects to the neuroscience of how and why aromatherapy might be effective. So it definitely is not just restricted to the neuroscience field, but it can be applied to school and other outside as well. And on to on the topic of school, um, my study skills, the the skills that I developed while I was trying to study for the brain, we have definitely transferred over. Um, I study for the brain usually just during winter break and, and the summer break. So uh, finding something productive and that you want to do over the break is, is really um, is, is a good idea because you don't want to, you want to still keep learning during that time. And I, I never thought of Quizlets or just creating a Google Doc table would be so helpful, but it really has been. And I've used that um, strategy for other classes as well. Thank you. Hemant. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of uh, really things I agree with there. Um, and so the first question, if I remember correctly, was about um, how did the NSF brain be? Uh, what did like what role did that play? Um, okay, and this is like firstly, I would just mention something. Like, if you really get into it, something that might be important um, it, to some of you would be that um, the U.S. national one. They have like this quirky rule set. Like the one of the important ones is that you can only do it once. So. Um, I think that's true, right? <laughs> um, yeah, that's that at least was true. For, yeah, it's true. Um, so you can only do the U.S. national rainbow once. So, um, like you know, if you really invest the time into it, just remember that if you like 
really want to go into it, you can like really like only participate once. However, the NSF one, nice thing about it is you can do it many times and um, it's at a high level. And um, for me personally, I started in eighth grade within did it till 10th grade. Um, and I really um, took out of it because I could, um, I could, I just like invested a lot of time in the summer to try to like learn the stuff in advance of the NSF brain bee. It's a really great way to both like motivate yourself like to like, okay, I, sh I should learn this stuff by then um, or stuff like that in, in the simplest term, but also in the sense that um, you can go there, you can see like what sort of questions are coming up. You can see the um, the type of, of things you should be thinking about, like, you know, the, the, de the depth of um, like diagnostic questions of um, all the different um, things that'll come up. So that was really helpful in terms of focusing me and probably if it wasn't for doing that in eighth grade, I never would have developed as thorough an interest um, in let alone the brain be just in neuroscience in general because it kind of motivated me, sparked that, that interest. So I'd recommend at least trying that. Um, in terms of studying for it, um, well, Priyanka um, is a better better at work than me. He, she made the the cards and stuff. I just mooched off of other people who had already made tables and cards and videos and everything. Like, there's a ton of existing Quizlets out there. Um, I found like it, like you said, I found um, you like Word documents that have the drugs listed out from Brain Facts and elsewhere and stuff like that. So, like, um, may, many of you will probably be more like lazy like me. Um, I just I personally just like reading through a lot of different stuff, don't like making that, um, making them. Um, some people benefit from that approach, but personally that's not me. Um, so um, that's what I did. I just like Googled like PDF brain facts drugs or um, uh, what's it called or, or Quizlet on this, this subject or that subject and plenty of stuff came up. Um, and it's just like with the YouTube video. So um, exploring that, that was a great idea. And then the last question, if I remember correctly, was about what you got out of this. Um, now, that, that one's um, now that I think back, it's actually doing this whole brain bee stuff, especially like to the level of the national one, had a pretty profound impact on me. Um, well beyond just like research or like you know my understanding of medicine or anything like that, because um, I mean from what what I see it as is well like people are the foundation of this world and the brain is the foundation of people. So really spending that depth of time. Um, understanding the brain, understanding, um, for example, like motivation pathways, like you'll spend a lot of time studying like dopaminergic pathways in the brain that are involved in rewarding and, um, you know, pain pathways, all these things that really involve like psychology, what motivates human behavior in general. And then that you, you will, like, if you spend enough time and really like get to know it, get beyond the weeds of just like neurons and, and axons and everything, it'll eventually start to come together. At least it did for me after a while, it took me a while. Um, like that this, like the application of this, you can see in economics in government and politics, so many things are based on human behavior. And if you understand the basis of human behavior in the brain, um, it really, um, it really allowed me to see the world in a, in a pretty different light, um, after investing that time. So it's a unique benefit you can get out of investing into this. And it's something that you have to like, really like, you know, put your passion into it because if you just, you know, memorize some facts in a book, you're not going to get that. But um, especially like going to the national level of both the NSF and especially the U.S. National Brain Bee, like doing the diagnostic stuff, the MRI, um, the histology, everything. Um, it really made me see all of this from different angles, like everything I had to learn from six different angles. And that helped me learn how to apply it in like a ton of different ways in all sorts of different fields. So um, I'd recommend um, when you're exploring topics to really try to do that, to um, explore it from those different angles. And hopefully then you'll you'll get a really great benefit as I did. The hedge? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess the initial question is how did you get or when did you get into Brain Bee? Like I said before, I started out in ninth grade, straight to the USA National Brain Bee. I didn't know what NSF was until I think like 10th grade. Um, and to elaborate a bit on why I decided to do the Brain Bee. Um, when when I when I was entering ninth grade, there's this like really impressive guy. His name is Roger. I'm not sure if you guys know Roger. And um, he was everyone was like, dang, this guy's so smart. Uh, he he competed in a lot of things, including the brain bee. And I was like, oh, I'm just gonna copy whatever Roger does. Um, and that's how I got into the brain bee. And um, yeah, and, and in terms of uh, how he got involved in the NSF, in tenth grade, I heard about NSF. And 
Um, I, I, I was going to compete at like the regional competition, but then I had a scheduling conflict with something else. Um, so I, I can't really speak into how NSF personally helped me, um, but from what I've heard, again, it, it, there's a huge overlap and I assume that doing well in one might correlate to doing well in the other. Um, talking a bit about what uh, Priyanka said and Himant about like study skills, and, and I kind of said this before, um, I think figuring out to doing Quizlets, doing, uh, I actually also had a lot of tables specifically with all the drugs on brain packs, all the different neuroimaging techniques, all the disorders. Um, I definitely think that, and, and Himan said this earlier, everyone has different study or learning techniques or learning skills. Um, and I think that's just some advice that I wanted to um, make clear that I've learned is that it's learning stuff and learning how to learn is constantly a learning process. Um, and basically what that means is, uh, as you keep on studying for things like brain B or schoolwork or other competitions, um, you constantly learn what works for you and what doesn't. And even in college, like I'm always like adapting my study strategies. Um, and I've learned at least what works for me personally and um, what works for, I think everyone in this panel is doing things like Quizlets, making tables, organizing information. So. Yeah, just be on the lookout uh, when it comes to figuring out how to study. Also, um, I created a Quizlet um, that I personally think is the best Quizlet for brain facts and for the other one, but it's also on private. So people like him month can't like see him who I'm competing with. Um, but I, I'm not sure if I could send out a link through this uh, platform, but I could send you the link in the passcode. Basically, why I think this Quizlet's the best is like literally every sentence on both textbooks, like literally has a flashcard for it. So, and I also scored, I think I was like one question away from a perfect on the written for uh, the national exam. So if you want high quality material, don't just Google it. I don't know, can I can I put the link on? I just pulled it up right now. You can um, put it on the chat box, can you? Yeah, I think the chat box restricts me or like- No. It, organizers it says organizers and panelists only is that okay. everyone uh put it there and i will post it for everybody go ahead um, okay just, yeah one, oh i just wanted to add one more thing on top of what sahed was saying um like um what's it called when when you're doing this like um i, I want to stress like one of the best things and i think i don't remember the product, but like really working with um another person or other people will make this much better like um well for me there wasn't really any like the brain bee wasn't common in my area so no one else was doing it uh but it, probably the best option is like find friends or a friend um or whatever to like do this with first um because like that way like um one of the things that really helped me is after i'd read through it understood it like uh my parents or somebody else like i would ask them to just like quiz me on things from the glossary and then once i'd mastered the glossary then we moved on to the index which has everything so like you know those kind of things they already are built into the thing but working with other people made it much more interesting because like then you could start talking about something you could google it together you could watch a youtube video together so especially if it's like you know a friend who's also doing it um that makes it a lot more fun but also um more likely you'll gain like you'll go to those deeper levels and if you were by yourself you'll probably just shirk it off another thing i want to add is um look at uh the web pages for other regional competitions so um there's there's several in each state and so if you just go to their website they often have handouts and practice like quizzes and um, practice questions on their website so that was really helpful for me in the beginning or just to review um, if you get bored of like just reading or watching then it's a great way to um, just uh, kind of re recollect what you um, studied and consolidated since um, you definitely want to keep reviewing what you've studied um, intermittently so that you don't, you're, you don't forget what you studied in the, in the very beginning so um, the handouts that the other that other websites have put out and also the quizzes and also some diagrams were really helpful for um, anatomy as well. Very good. <clears throat> Next question, yeah. which has partly been covered, right? But there, it keeps kind of coming up. Uh, one minute, um, uh, Balo. Before we go, there are a number of questions about uh, the websites and the links and the books you've been throwing around. 
uh, if you could give me the list consolidate list uh, email to me i will in include it in their follow up email to all these people so we don't have to individually answer uh, those questions are in chats or anything. Can you do that by uh, tomorrow morning, at least? Thank you, thank you, guys. Okay, Balu, please go ahead. Great. So uh, a number of questions, right? And we'll we'll go in reverse order. I'll call on each of you. But a number of questions around uh, how do you actually, you know, get going with research, right? At what age? How do you get a contact, right? Why would anyone, you know, if you're in middle school, why would anyone engage you for research, right? So how do you, you know, how does that, where does that even begin, right? A lot of people, and this is not unique to BrainBee, they're they just, you know, how do you even get started, right? Um, we'll start with Sahaj and then we'll go to Hemant and Priyanka from there. Yeah, I'm probably not the best person to ask. Well, I guess I've failed every single time I tried to get research, so I guess I'm, a good example of not, I don't know, uh, what not to do. But in eighth grade, I was kind of interested in research. My friend and I, we emailed a bunch of professors in the area. We didn't get any replies. Um, then in 10th grade, after I won the regional brain bee, and I mentioned this before, we got to work with the RWJ staff and um, or the local medical school staff. And they, after I did well in the national brain bee, they even were like, hey, if you want to research with us um, that, you know, feel free to like hit us up and we could like hook you up with a lab. And I rejected them because I thought, oh, I don't have time to research. I'm going to my junior year. I should study for actual competitions. And then I regretted that a lot. Um, and then uh, junior year, I tried to apply to these research programs. I know Himanta's RSI. RSI is insane. I didn't even think of applying to RSI because it's really hard. Um, so I tried to get research like every year after that even now as a college student trying to get research in my own college, insanely hard. Um, so I, I know Priyanka mentioned like, oh, I'm sure you'll get it if you try. I've tried, hopefully one day I'll someday get a research position. Um, so yeah, I, I honestly don't know how to get it. I think from my experience from like friends I have in high school, if you know an adult who works at a hospital or you know some research or your dad is a friend or something, it's a bit easier. Um, I personally don't have that privilege. Um, so yeah, I guess research is a sensitive topic for me. Um, as like I talked about before, like um, again, like most of what I did until like late in high school um, and still kind of now like has been like at home type projects. So like, you know, you won't have like the most fancy equipment, like, you know, million dollar microscopes or whatever, but like those are honestly the places I've learned the most and enjoyed the most. Um, just because like one, you get to control the full like idea, like it is your idea, like you have like something you can make the thing you're most passionate about, the thing you're most interested in, it's completely your choice. You get to create the experiment, you get to do the whole thing, you get to analyze it. It's not going to be the biggest scale project, but especially if you're in middle school, I think that's the best um, avenue to go find something you're really interested in. And then think of a creative idea. Don't just like, you know, Google, oh, this was an experiment somebody did or this experiment I saw at my science fair. Think about like, okay, I, I saw some stuff when I was Googling around about research or I saw this thing. What's a new step I could take? What's a new um, avenue? So like find the balance, straddle the line between don't copy somebody else, but make sure you are trying to be inspired by other people because otherwise it's really difficult. They're like, oh, this was a really interesting experiment or um, when I was reading the Brain Facts book, I was really interested in this idea of plasticity, like, like the brain learning um, and like physically changing that. I wonder what I like, you know, I was I was particularly confused about how um, how fast the brain can be like plastic based on which neurons are involved or how old the neurons are. So maybe I'll do an experiment about like different age neurons um, or like, you know, but that's too difficult. So let me use a worm and just stick some pins in them or let me just um, do something more psychology oriented and have my friends and make my friends or my friends parents do it or stuff like that. Like so. Think about as many ideas as freely as possible, then go based on that. Then maybe once you're in like, you know, 10th, 11th grade, um, if you're really interested, you can do it earlier. But at that point, like you should hopefully have enough of a basis that um, either you can like go to like research camps like I did, or you can um, try to reach out for people. But like like Sedge said, I think um, it, it isn't always like very easy to get that, especially in your high school. And especially if you're in an area that doesn't have, like, you know, I was lucky in the sense that 
I lived um, in Rochester, Minnesota, so the Mayo Clinic's there, but few places have like research institutions that big. Um, the, the thing is like at a middle school or high school level, all like interesting research could be done like, you know, basically at home or maybe even getting like, you know, asking some guy, I, I don't want to like interrupt you, but like, can I like use this in your lab for like one day or like this microscope or whatever? And they'll usually like, often say yes, if you ask them people. So the point is that like, um, not only is it possible to do most middle school, high school level projects pretty um, readily at home, it honestly, in, in my experience, was better um, for a lot of cases because one, it was completely my thing. So I got to think of the idea and it really made me passionate and work hard for it. Um, and second thing is um, you have to get really creative about it. Like it really makes you understand experimental methodologies and like how to design these kind of things really well because you don't have like a ton of money to buy equipment and everything. So you have to be creative about um, how you do it. Like for example, I was working on this project um, involving um, electroporation, which is just basically applying an electric current um, with a like a high uh, current with a low voltage, um, sorry, high voltage, low current. Um, and it's a pretty simple procedure just using a battery and stuff like that. And I wanted to model like how this would work through um, nervous tissue because I was like trying to show how it could like disinfect stuff. And I did like in the body and I didn't want to sort of affect nervous tissue. So I literally remembered my seventh grade project. This was in 11th grade. I was like, oh, in seventh grade, I put a worm and put some like electrodes in it. I have pin electrodes, like you know, push pins, and monitored its activity. So I literally put a worm in between the stuff and watched, like, try to see how that it affected the worm's electrical conduction. So, like, the point is that, like, you know, you have to be creative. You have to do that sort of thing when you when you're designing the project yourself. So that's something I'd recommend exploring. Priyanka. So my research experience has been a little bit different from Hemant's. I didn't do any um, research projects at home. So all of mine have been uh, with university professors. And I think my situation is also a little bit unique since I, um, I'm i dual enrolled at the u university. So um, it, it might have been a little bit easier for me to reach out to the professors. So mainly what I did was um, just write an email template with a resume and cover letter and just send it out to a bunch of professors with um, whose research that I was um, really interested in. So most of it was in neuroscience or biology. And um, by a lot, I mean a lot, um, probably uh, close to like 70 or eight or 70 professors before I was able to get a response. So um, definitely don't be discouraged if you don't hear back. A lot of professors just won't hear back or they'll tell you that their lab is full or that they can't take on people right now. And that's often the response. So definitely don't be discouraged by it. But when um, writing your email template, I would say explain why you're interested in the lab um, and then talk about some of it, your experience with in neuroscience or whatever field that you want to to go into just show that you're enthusiastic and that you want to learn and a lot of professors will appreciate that and will take you on even if you are young because they want to uh, encourage that and also um, talk about their research show that you've done research on their research so read a publication that they've written and talk about why you're interested in that publication that you want to maybe just talk with them have a meeting with them first before before really talking about um, the potentially working in their lab and then also give them the amount of time that you're able to commit and and just um, things like that so and also um, explain what your goals are and what what you want to learn and if you just show that you're interested um, definitely professors will appreciate that and will um, be willing to at least have a meeting with you and you'll be able to talk with them and and kind of just uh, adjust your like way of approaching as you as you see fit um, as you go on but um, reach out to professors and and I would say just reach out to your local university. Um, that, that worked for me, but I'm not sure if it'll work for everyone. And also um, it doesn't just have to be your local university. I've also reached out to universities outside of my state and it usually is harder to get remote research opportunities, but especially now um, there are more professors willing to do that. And so, um, yeah, I would say just just keep at it. Um, that's what really uh, helped me. And I was just recently reading back at my first emails that I sent to professors in in tenth grade for research opportunities, and I really didn't have any research experience other than learning about the brain through the brain through the brain week competitions. And so I was like wondering like why they would even take me on, which was like part of the question asked. And so um, while you may not have experience, everyone starts off without experience. And so just keep that in mind. Just 
reach out, um, don't get discouraged. And if you want, your teachers probably have some connections and doctors at your local university are also a great way to, uh, not sorry, doctors at um, local hospitals or research centers are also great. It doesn't just have to be in a university setting. There's often um, uh, other like companies or um, that also do research that aren't um, like, that aren't uh, for, based on a university or a hospital. So you can also look um, at things like that. And I think um, maybe talking with older students is also great. Um, definitely networking is a huge part of research. Once you get one research internship, it's really easy to get other research internships, but getting the first research internship might be harder. If you have a friend who has, um, who's researching in a lab, then you can ask them to refer you, or if you can just do like a, um, a few weeks in their lab, and if you really put in the effort and the professor likes, wants to have you, it might continue. So uh, definitely just, just start off with reaching out, um, try to network as you go, and just know that once you get one research opportunity or, or something like that, it's usually often much easier to get other research opportunities. Um, and just to add a bit of context, like just like thinking about like in this call itself, there are three or were three doctors like who are trying to get all of you watching interested in this. So like there are a lot of people out there who are going to be willing to help you. Not all of them might be able to like support you in their lab, like, you know, hopefully some will be able to, but like, you know, like if you're doing a project yourself, like tons of times they're just email doctors or people like who I didn't know or whatever, and just ask them like, hey, I was wondering about this, this um, technology or this like, you know, part of it, could you explain this a bit better? Um, they might not have the ability to put you in the lab, but they will like, so many people will be happy to just answer your questions um, to um, refer you to other places where there might be more space like all that sort of stuff. Like don't, like not everything you interact with, with like, you know, people who are like experts in the field has to be about like getting a lab necessarily. A lot of it can just be about like, can I, can you explain this better for me um, so that I can do it? Or could you tell me where to look to really improve this skill or to, or to look for a lab or whatever you want to do? I would just add one other thing, right? It takes some humility and some, also you need other skills. So for example, my older son, who is a ninth grader, he wanted to help a math professor. And what the math professor said was, I don't need any help with the math research, but what I do need help with is um, I need to spread the word about something that we're working on. And I need to be able to draw more people in, right? To learn more about it. And so he got the opportunity, right? To help build essentially, right? A marketing plan to get the word out my sixth grader right you're going to see some slides my sixth grader makes those slides so imagine right reaching out and not only saying i know about your research but these are some other skills right that i can do i'm well versed in social media i can I, i'm comfortable with google suite and i can you know format word documents and i can record video and i can do powerpoints those are simple things that you know uh, somebody may not actually have capacity to do but it may be attractive to them so make sure that the skill set that one has right is broad and not just based on a single subject soft skills sometimes are lacking in some of these labs and among some of these researchers and they may welcome that and that may open the door right where nobody else has even asked about uh, being able to offer that um, the next question that's listed here, or a nice question is listed. Question from a kid's perspective. Um, given that Indian parents want their kids to get into a shining subject that they think their kid needs to get into, how did you, quote, kids choose the areas you liked to get into and handle parental pressure? I personally, I think I'm kind of lucky in the sense that my parents didn't really put that much pressure, at least in middle school or high school, where you need to study this or not study that. Um, I kind of, I remember in sixth grade, fifth grade, uh, fourth grade, probably, I would just make a list of things that I wanted to learn, uh, whether it was karate or music, and I would just learn random stuff. Um, I didn't really get into science until like sixth grade or seventh grade. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know what Science Olympiad is. Um, but I tried out for the school science Olympiad team, and I guess it's a common theme in my life. And I got like every question wrong. And I was like, oh, this is uh, science Olympiad. Like there are a lot of cool terms I had no idea, like hydrogen spectrum, greenhouse gases. So I went, so actually I did something illegal. I took out a paper during the test and I wrote down every single term I didn't know. I went back home and then I just Googled all of them. And I came back next year 
and I, I made the team. I, I, I passed the exam, fortunately. And then in Science Olympiad, you have to choose an event or you have to choose your specialty. And I had no specialty. I had no skills. So I used a random number generator and I picked random topics. Um, I got meteorology, which is a study of weather, something really random, and genetics, whatever genetics is, I had no clue. And I just competed in them. Uh, in seventh grade, I failed everything, like always. But then in eighth grade, I, I actually like, I, I actually started enjoying random stuff like meteorology. Um, and I just started discovering random things. So for me, a lot of things just happen randomly. I just jump into it and then I try to learn meteorology. Uh, so an adv some advice I would give, uh, especially to middle school students, is trying out a lot of different, uh, different topics. I, I think a hard question is how do you know whether that topic is good for you? How do you try out topics? Do you Google stuff? Um, I think, um, I mean, if I, were, if I was a middle school right now, um, and, and I mentioned this before, a great organization, SCIO Virtual, where I teach, SCIO, virtual.org um, i would check it out uh, basically um, what these courses are is there are a bunch of different topics like meteorology genetics uh, anatomy and you get to work with high school and college students who are experts in their field i personally teach meteorology but my course is full so yeah you wouldn't be able to attend it but um and just register or sign up for multiple courses figure out what interests you uh, if you have a math background, you might be more interested in physics and um, I don't know, I don't I, I was I personally wasn't great at math. So I just went with like biology and earth science, just trying trying out different things. And um, that, that's probably the biggest advice I could give. Um, and it's hard and I think it's going to change. I personally don't know what I want to do. And it's changed for the last like 10 years, um, but just trying things. And then hopefully one day when you're older, you'll stick to something. It's probably pretty vague advice. Um, yes, yeah, so like um, uh, in terms of well, like what to do, especially if you're like a kid, is it's really important to remember that like there is like geniuses, like great people in every single field. Like like it is important to like keep in your mind that it's not just sciences or it's not just like one specific field in science or whatever. Um, like you know, there's like the Michael Phelps, the Olympic gold medalist, or there's um, Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel laureate in economics, um, and then there's also like uh, brilliant people in neuroscience and in other medical fields or other scientific fields, um, and like to just keep that in mind is to remember that like people have pushed the boundaries in all of these fields to the benefit of a lot of people, um, and if you like the I think the best way in terms of like dealing with any sort of pressure is just to keep in mind that you well one you're the, in control of what you learn and if there's something you really like. Just, I mean, remind yourself, remind those around you that by not just by your words, but also by your actions, that like I'm gonna get really into this and I'm going to like become like a really strong at this this subject. And then like that'll speak for itself. Like if you really like something, get super into it. Um, it'll almost surely, whatever the field, show some level of um like really like thoughtful intelligence effort, whatever the field is. Like personally, um, I mean, like I got really into neuroscience, but like for example, my the the, the not really a class this like I, I self studied for this AP test and that was the most I got out of any subject in high school and that was AP art history. It was something I never learned about before, never thought about um, before that, but just like I learned a ton for that thing and I loved it. Um, and now like you know at, at college you know I'm like thinking about like maybe studying economics more, focus on um, the the point I'm trying to get across is like you know just um, um, figure out like what you're liking. And then the second part of that, you can't just like say, I want to do this. You have to be like, okay, well, if I like it, well, then I probably should like doing stuff in it and learning, like watching YouTube videos out, learning from Wikipedia articles, um, trying to do some of my own like for fun research about it or whatever, write a paper about it. If you do that yourself, if you prove to people around you that you are interested in it, that you have experience, you have talent in this field because you like it, well, then no one can tell you like, well, you should do this other field if you've already shown to yourself and to others that you have the what it takes to to, to really get into this field, that you really like it and you're willing to put your um, money where your mouth is. Yeah, so I just like to kind of echo what um, both Hemant and Sehaj said. Um, really, just um, for, for me, this, it, I have the same advice, just explore different fields and what you're interested in. Um, and 
finding what you're interested in can take a long time. It, it definitely took me a long time. I didn't really have anything that I was particularly very passionate about until, until 10th grade. And like, that is, that's like a long time. And so as, as kids, you don't have to, you don't have to find something that you're, you're fully passionate about that you want to commit for like the entire, for your entire life. Just explore different things, find out what, what projects you like to do, what you are personally invested in, because in order to um, kind of be successful in anything, you need to have that internal drive to to put in the time and effort. And if you if you are doing something just for a competition or just to win something, then oftentimes it won't last that long, and you won't be able to sustain it for a long time. And that's very important. Being able to take um, and able to in being able to do well in a competition, not only in a competition but also to apply it elsewhere and that's often like the, the goal isn't always just to win a competition but to take the skills and knowledge that you gain from preparing for a competition um in, in the future and so definitely um i think you personally what i feel is that you need to find something that you are invested in not your parents or not your not someone else who's putting pressure on you to um, follow a field so um ex explore what you're interested in and know that you don't have to figure out what you like and um i'm going to college and I still don't really know what I want to major in. I do really like neuroscience, but I'm still exploring. And so you don't have to find like your thing um, early on. Just explore different things that you like. So I know that I, I like medicine. I know that I want, I also like research. So you can, you can then explore things in that field. And if you, um, if you want to do it, if I, what I like to think of is um, find something that you want to do on a Saturday morning. And if, if, you see yourself like pursuing um, something on that subject or preparing for the competition like on, on a Saturday, Saturday morning, then that's definitely something that you want to do and that you are not pressured to do. And so um, that's really all the advice I have. Definitely just find find what you like to do and you'll know when you find something that you like to do because you won't have to you won't have to force yourself to do it. And oftentimes I don't really create a study plan for when I want to study or what I want to do. It, it just kind of falls into place because I make time for it because that's something I genuinely like to do. And then um, now when, after in high school, I've been able to kind of decide what courses I want to take and um, and what I want to study. So it, it really um, it has been me making those decisions. And so just follow follow what you like to do and everything will just kind of fall into place. But it can take time to figure out what you like to do. So in order to figure out what you like to do, explore things when you're younger. A lot of you have asked about the various links. I think uh, Dr. Vijay mentioned, right, that uh, there will be a summary of things that get sent out. Um, and included in that, I will give him a link to a TED talk by uh, General Colin Powell. And one of the things he talks about, the basic theme, right, is do what you love and love what you do. And so, um, you know, if all of the messaging about pursuing anything that's interesting, right, any subject, if it's all coming from someone external to the student, it's not going to work, right? It has to at some point become internal. Uh, and I think that's what all of our speakers are telling us, right? The spark, you know, the introduction can come from a parent, but then at some point, right, that's got to be converted into something that comes from the inside. And, and there has to be a huge appetite for it and pursuing it. And I think that's really important. Um, I don't think that we have a whole lot of time for more questions. So we'll just do a quick one. Priyanka, did you write a book? Someone was asking. Yeah, I actually did write a book. Um, it's called uh, Brain, the Most Complex Organ. It's just a kind of overview of um, some of the main topics and concepts that I've uh, learned through my classes at my university and also preparing for the brain being general. Um, so it, it talks about different things like neurological disorders, brain imaging techniques, um, basic stuff from just neurons, how um, synaptic transmission works. And um, so, yeah, that was just a nice project that I had um, throughout high school. Uh, there are questions about the brain facts. Where do you, where do you get them? What it is, and uh, you know, is there a book or is a PDF or? Uh... Um, well, like what I did is I just like it's a free PDF online. It's made by an organization. I think you can probably buy a, a, like a small book version, but it's like you just I just download the PDF, printed it off, and put it in like a binder, and then just read it from there. 
Um, so like, there's a lot of ways to do that. Like another way I did, like I had a printed version, then I downloaded one um, into like my my phone into like the Google Books app, um, and then would read it there because um, I didn't always want to lug that thing around. It's like so, especially when it got close to the competitions. Like whenever I had some free time, I was just sitting like waiting for a bus or whatever. I would just like pop open my phone, um, review some stuff, like like just read read some new stuff or whatever. Um, so I think that's that 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 having one printed copy and one uh, virtual copy helped a lot for me. Thank you. I know we can keep on going for hours and still we will not cover it. So we want to move on to Dr. Bal Nadraja's presentation about uh, the North South competition. So I, you know, I, I was really fascinated, right? Because I had already made these slides. Well, quite frankly, my sixth grader did, right? But Priyanka, you talked about, you know, succeeding is a marathon, not a sprint. And I think that that's really what all of you have illustrated. And that is very central to how we approach things at the North-South Foundation. And so we have a wonderful sketch here, which by the way, was made by a high schooler in New Jersey. So she's a volunteer and her dad is a volunteer. And what she's done is connect the concepts of empathy, education, and excellence. And you can see right that everything that we're doing is it's an education marathon but it's really a life marathon because all of the ingredients all of the training that we do right we think we're training for a single marathon event but actually we wind up learning things that serve us for our whole lives and so we can go for prep clubs and coaching which are the equivalent of training in a marathon we can do practice runs we can and when we do that right not only do we uh, get better at running but we learn a lot we find out about our bodies we also will meet people if we do group sort of sessions and so that is the equivalent of our practice workshops and then we've got the actual event which is like our contests at north south and certainly uh, other national events as well and you might get that honor roll you also might like Sahaj the first couple of times right not get anything right at all but it's still part of the journey the cool thing is the entire time right we are delivering on our goal of empathy so our contest fees will help provide education for children halfway around the world who can't otherwise afford it we have other events and activities through our young change makers that allow us to support children here uh, who don't have access to education and so this cycle continues and that that notion of empathy excellence and education really helps with the marathon of life and so if you want to be a success like these three people who are at top schools and writing books and doing great in competitions such as the brain bee it takes practice and so our version of practice one of the things that we offer right is through our regional contests and so registration is now open we will make sure um, that that link to all of these nine subjects is available in the links that dr vijay sends out just again right success is a marathon not a sprint and sort of recap some of the things that we've learned right Sahaj talked to us about learning how to learn and also very much illustrated that success first requires failing a number of times and those failures are not actually a failure they're actually just part of the marathon Priyanka talked to us about how you know things can cross over from one subject to the next and that every ingredient can actually support other things that we do. And Hamant really painted a picture of curiosity. And so, you know, we can be exposed to something by someone else, but at some point we have to be so excited that we're actually going down that, down that rabbit hole, hole of learning, right? And all of those things are really components of success. And we would love for you to join us in our coaching and certainly our upcoming contest and be a part of this life marathon with us at the North South Foundation. Thank you, Dr. Follow, for the excellent summary of the whole thing. And uh, thank you guys, uh, um, Hemant, 
Sehej and Priyanka for your time and efforts to make this happen. Thanks to Dr. Balan Narajan and uh, Krishnan Gauri for all their time and efforts. Thank you for all of you for participating in this uh, discussion. I hope you got something out of it. I know we, we haven't answered all the questions you asked, but still we got the crux of it and then you can go from there. We got the thing um, to start with. Uh, thank you everybody uh, for being here. We'll be sending you the link for the recorded uh, version of this webinar to you by tomorrow afternoon. And uh, all the material, <clears throat> links and materials uh, the uh, pros gives it to me i will attach it to or send it to them uh, we are going to have yet another uh, wonderful webinar on february 7th at the same time 12 noon two weeks from now that is going to be on spelling and okay pros uh, remember february 7th is a super bowl sunday but I think we have a better show here with so many of uh, national champions in spelling taking part and talking to you. Please plan to attend the webinar. Please watch for the email with more details and the links for the registration. And uh, please do register, participate. <coughs> also tell all your friends to register and participate. Thank you for your continued support. Please stay healthy and safe. And, uh, you know, we will see you again and next time. Um, you got any final words, uh, guys? Heyman? Sihaj or Priyanka? I mean, just good luck. Uh, and, uh, yeah, again, like we were all talking about, like, if you put your mind, like, to it um, or whatever, like, you're interested in, like, just spend a lot of time, like, um, exploring more than just the reading books like this is not a memorization thing so much as um find things like videos stuff you're interested in you'll you'll do great um if you spend like like Sahaj said like more than just like a month like you have to spend quite a while but if you get into it it'll be great yeah uh my final word is sio virtual check it out scio virtual.org every time i mention it i have the analytics pulled up and it goes up a bit the amount mm -hmm. of people in our website <laughs> Yeah, thank you guys all for listening. I hope this was helpful um, for you guys. And um, just continue to figure out what you like to do. And once you find it, just take the initiative to um, go up, go in the path that you want to go. One quick question to Sahaj. You mentioned about the coaching middle school kids. Uh, is there any way uh, any of others can access that? Is it online or? Yeah. Um... I could I could put the link and you could send in the follow up. Please, yeah. yeah. Some of them are it's, interested in that. Okay, please send it yeah. out. Um, thank you, also everybody. SCIO.org. It doesn't seem to go anywhere. Some people are confused. Uh, sorry, SCIOvirtual.org. I could put it on the. Ah, okay. So the virtual part was missing. All right, now we got it. Thank you. Yeah, put up all the links, names of the books and whatever you can recommend. We will send it to them by you know, tomorrow by noon. We'll be sending the email. So please send it to me as soon as you can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Balnar Rajan and uh, Dr. Krishan Gauri for uh, making this more lively and interesting. And then we will- Thank uh, you, Casey and all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.